four out of 10 cancers has the potential to be prevented through healthy lifestyle habits. So um, those are really relating to the common cancers like breast, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer, which together make up sort of 50% of cancers that we will suffer with. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsy and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsy? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups, and there we are the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm without my wonderful co-host, Dotsie Bausch, because she is still writing her book, as I mentioned last week, but she will be back in a couple weeks, and I'm very excited because I miss her a lot, but I'm also extremely happy that she's spreading the word through her book, and I know that this period of pain is going to be worth it very much because I'm very excited to read what she has to say. Her, she's had an amazing life. And of course, we all admire so much her strength and philosophy through Switch for Good. So the book is going to contain all of that. Today, we have a topic that has hit so many of us, um, including myself. We're going to talk with Dr. Shireen Kassam, who works with cancer patients. And my mom has survived lung and breast cancer. And what was amazing was that it took me to kind of nudge her to um, change her diet because none of the doctors mentioned that when she was diagnosed. And I asked on my birthday uh, whether as, if, as a gift, if she would watch Forks Over Knives, which was um, playing at the time. And she did. And she gave up dairy. And I think that that was, I personally believe that that is one of the, uh, she's now 85. And uh, these cancers have occurred in the last 10 years, but she survived them both. And I really do attribute her healthy lifestyle to it. We're going to talk to Dr. Kassam about this because this is where you'll get this kind of information and probably not, unfortunately, in a lot of the, in a lot of the doctor's offices at oncology centers. But that's changing if Dr. Kassam has anything to do with it. So let me just introduce you to her and then we'll start our wonderful chat. Dr. Shireen Kassam is a lifestyle medicine doctor with a specialist interest in lymphoma. She's also a hematologist at King's College Hospital in London. Dr. Kassam teaches the UK's first college course on plant-based nutrition at Winchester University. Shireen didn't stop there though. She founded Plant-Based Health Professionals UK to educate other doctors and nutritionists and everyone else on the benefits of whole food plant diets. And she has a telemedicine practice so she can help even more people. <laughs> and expanding her reach even farther, she is also the author of the new book, Eating Plant-Based. Today, we're gonna discuss how to treat cancer through lifestyle and get some of her insights into being the healthiest we can be so we don't get cancer in the first place. Welcome Dr. Shireen Kassam to Switch for Good. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I've been a great admirer of your work and it's great to be here. Oh, well, we're so glad to have you. And you're all the way across the pond and across the continent since I'm in California in uh, the UK. So thanks for making the time to be with us. Pleasure. I want to start really basic. Since cancer is one of the leading causes of death worldwide, and as I mentioned in the intro, it's touched so many people, including myself and undoubtedly so many of our listeners and watchers, I'd like to start with a really basic question. Can you tell me what cancer is? 
Yeah, great question. And I'm so pleased to also hear that your mum's doing so well. Um, so yeah, on a really basic level, cancer is the deregulated growth of cells, abnormal cells that um, uh, accumulate the ability um, through mutations in the cells, so genetic mutations, to continue growing when they shouldn't. Um, and they take over the organ that the growth starts in and starts um, meaning that that organ doesn't function properly. And eventually, once it's at an advanced stage, it might exit that original organ that it started growing in and find its way to other um, parts of the body. Um, and, and that's the most advanced stage. So somehow a cell, a single cell, will acquire this growth advantage um, that means that um, it can grow unchecked um, and disturb the rest of the body. Tell me if this is true. I had heard that that cancer shows up in our body like all the time and our body pounces on it and gets rid of it if we have the right in environment to do that. Yeah, absolutely. We're sitting here sort of generating um, these cells that have the potential to become a cancer, but we have hopefully an intact immune system that can recognize that cell as a rogue cell and either keep it there at a low level so it doesn't start growing or just get rid of it and that cell dies and um, you know the proteins are reused and it no longer exists. So yes, we hope that in a healthy body um, that we can keep these abnormal cells that are uh, appearing all the time in check so it doesn't cause us any harm. Does that mean that by the time that we discover cancer that it has actually been growing in our body for a long time? Yeah, that's highly likely really that you know that the first steps of that cancer growth happened several years if not decades before it, it presents as a clinically apparent problem, whether that's a lump or um, uh, a problem with the organ that it's growing in, like kidney failure, renal failure, um, liver failure, that sort of thing. So since cancer cells pop up all the time, does the whether or not the cancer proliferates or gets overcome by our immune system, how much does it depend on our lifestyle? Yeah, but that's a really interesting question and clearly something that I've now become very um, passionate about sort of promoting in terms of healthy lifestyles. It differs based on which cancer we're talking about, but overall, in general, four out of 10 cancers has the potential to be prevented through healthy lifestyle habits. So um, those are really relating to the common cancers like breast lung cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancer, which together make up sort of 50% of cancers that we will suffer with. And the, uh, it's so great, my mom's cancers fell into that category. <laughs> so, um, so the World Health Organization says that one third of cancer deaths are due to five factors. And I'll just, well, if you, would you like to share since um, yeah, you're I'm the sure. expert? I mean, <laughs> Um, I'm glad that you know all about them because I think that's half the problem that um, we're not getting this ed education and information out there. So yeah, I mean the the key um, preventable aspects of cancer are you know having a healthy diet um, and centering our diet around whole plant foods. So one of the risk factors for cancer is not eating enough fruits and vegetables um, and sort of you know of course that goes along with not eating enough fiber that we're all deficient in. Um, not um, uh, so consuming too much alcohol or any alcohol um, is a risk for, for cancer. Carrying too much weight is now the second leading cause of cancer. And we know that's intimately related to obviously our diet, but other lifestyle um, and socioeconomic factors. Um, still, sadly, the number one leading cause of cancer globally is smoking tobacco. But as I say, that's sort of leveling up now with the other lifestyle factors. And um, being physically inactive, so a sedentary lifestyle um, increases your risk unsafe exposure to the sun is, is one that we're all probably quite familiar with. So those sort of five or six factors really take care of four out of 10 um, cancers that could be prevented. Tell me a little bit more, can you elaborate on the high body mass? Um, how does that cause cancer? 
Yeah, so carrying um, too much weight, we, we sort of just think about it as the way we look, but actually the fat we carry under our skin and in our organs is actually sort of an active tissue, as it were, so that those fat cells are um, still metabolizing and have got their functions intact and really creates this low-grade inflammation in the body. Um, and so the cells are secreting these um, inflammatory proteins and what we call cytokines, which then have a knock-on effect on um, the other cells in the body. Um, and these cells also produce hormones. So, for example, carrying too much weight will increase your estrogen level. And we know estrogen is a driver of certain female cancers. It'll also increase the level of another growth hormone called insulin-like growth factor, which sort of has a direct association with um, one's risk of, of cancer. So it's really that um, combined low grade inflammation and the ability to secrete growth hormones that give um, these rogue cells that are sort of sitting there waiting to, to receive signals that boost to start, um, start growing. Um, and I think the other thing that we also don't mention enough and that's really um, critical to realize is that other underlying health conditions, which of course are increased by carrying too much weight, like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, kidney failure, liver problems, fatty liver, also increase your risk of um, cancer. So, um, you know, your other guests will have talked about how healthy lifestyles reduce your risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and um, dementia later in life. Um, but those same conditions share the same mechanism of onset as cancer, that low-grade inflammation, that disturbed metabolism, the increased growth factor levels. Um, and so, you know, preventing those other chronic illnesses are really also key to preventing cancer in the, in the longer term. About a third of the risk of cancers, it seems, from some, some of the studies that I've um, read, comes from just having underlying health conditions. And so thank you for um, explaining why fat would contribute to cancer. What about exercise? What is it about exercise that makes, uh, gives us um, either helps us eat up those bad cancer cells early on or somehow they don't proliferate at all? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and it pro uh, probably physical activity does it does exactly the same in terms of the mechanism of action as a healthy diet. So for one, it helps maintain a healthy weight. So, you know, you're carrying less um, fat cells. You have better insulin sensitivity. Um, so lower levels of insulin, because we know that insulin, if it's at high levels, it's not functioning well, can promote the growth of, of um, cancer cells. Physical activity um, reduces your growth hormone levels, like insulin-like growth factor and estrogen. Um, it also can change the expression of our genes. So, you know, um, um, we talk a lot about, you know, our genetic risk of various diseases, but just because you're born with a certain gene doesn't mean that um, inevitably you'll get a, a certain condition because we can change the expression of genes and physical activity does that. It can alter your gene expression. It can also alter the length of your telomeres, which are the caps at the end of the chromosome, which are associated with um, aging. Um, so it, it does an awful lot of um, things um, uh, in, you know, together, it's difficult to pinpoint which one exactly is going to be um, reducing our risk of cancer, but together, um, physical activity does all those things. And of course, it's, it reduces inflammation, uh, you know, opposed to many of the other exposures in our life that increase inflammation. I learned that doing research uh, on, on this issue uh, before our talk is that 13% of cancers are also from bacteria, parasites and viruses like HPV or hepatitis B and C and Epstein-Barr. I didn't know that. I always, I always assumed that cancer was, this is what I was taught. And I think most of us were. It's either your genes or the chemicals that you're exposed to. Um, and so now I'm hearing, of course, as an adult and being in the plant-based world, I'm learning it has so much to do with lifestyle and also now these bacteria and parasites and viruses. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, as you say, infectious agents are another big group of causes of um, cancer, which you may or may not have control over. Um, in my world of looking after people with lymphoma, for example, um, we have a particular uh, stomach lymphoma that is caused directly by um, Helicobacter pylori, which is that bug that um, sits in our stomach and can cause inflammation and um, gastric ulcers. Um, HIV infection, the commonest cancer in people um, living with HIV is lymphoma. Um, and the list goes on, there's hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So absolutely sort of preventing um, exposure um, and infection with these agents will for sure um, reduce your risk. But, but, it, but it's small, as you say, it's 13%. 13 you might well be right. I, I don't know the exact figure there. But um, certainly our genetics um, is less than 10%. Um, uh, yeah. and, and how much about chemicals that are in our water and our air? do you feel? Yeah, I mean, that's so difficult to quantify, isn't it? Because, you know, so many of our exposures are overlapping. So I haven't got a good figure for that. But, you know, we kind of know in, in individual terms that various um, exposures in the environment um, do increase our risk of damaging our cells. Um, but it's that, it's that balance, isn't it? You know, you can sort of counteract those um, damaging effects by, you know, lots of physical activity, bathing your cells in lots of antioxidants. So it's kind of way, it's kind of having that balancing act, isn't it? Because there's so many things in our environment that we can't really control. You know, even air pollution is going to have, a, have an effect. Right, exactly. So we're going to go into lifestyle because that's what, that's what we're here for is to really talk about your work as a lifestyle medicine doctor. Can you talk to us a little bit about A, how you got into that? Because you didn't start off that way with an awareness of how important food is, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your focus cancer. But um, also you, um, you know, a lot of folks don't know that lifestyle has such an impact. And so if, if you could talk a little bit about how you um, became involved and how that changed your practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you. So, I mean, I guess my primar my, primarily I work as a hematologist and as you say, um, looking after people with um, particular cancer called lymphoma, of which there's sort of 40 different subtypes at, at least. So the hematologist the is blood, right? That's right. So, um, but within that, there's um, specialties, and and my one is is lymphoma, um, and it was really through that work that um, I was meeting my patients with um, lots of comorbidities, so other um, underlying conditions like type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, that was sort of making my life a bit more difficult um, to treat. Um, uh, their actual cancer, um, and then recognizing that people's um, quality of life and longevity after a diagnosis of cancer um, could be um, improved um, through healthy lifestyle habits. But I guess the answer to your question is how I sort of found out about food as medicine was really when I became vegan for, for the animals, so for ethical reasons back in 2013. And then, you know, you kind of want to learn the science behind eating a plant-based diet. Is it good for you? And if it is, how are you going to do it well? And then came across all that wealth of information that you're well aware of, like forks over knives and then delving into the research of the clinicians that were featured in there and realizing that there was decades and decades worth of um, research telling us that, you know, a really healthy way to eat is centering our diet around whole plant foods. So it was sort of win-win because, you know, it's great for the animals, of course, and it's um, just as good for us as humans. And then, you know, understanding that the World Cancer Research Fund also says, you know, if you want to prevent cancer and live well after a diagnosis of cancer, Answer, that you should be eating a diet centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, um, and that to us is a whole food plant-based diet. So it sort of did a full circle of realizing, well, this is great for me, it's great for the animals, it's great for my patients. Um, and then, you know, through this, um, meeting other like-minded professionals and realizing that there was um, a, a specialty called lifestyle medicine that along with diet and nutrition incorporated avoiding toxins and, you know, restorative sleep that together um, have a, a, an amazing effect on um, quality and long
longevity in, in, in all our lives, not just for people with cancer. Um, so I got the qualification that, you know, everyone gets the diploma in lifestyle medicine and, um, you know, try and incorporate that knowledge um, to support my patients uh, a bit better than perhaps I did a, a decade ago. What is the reaction from your colleagues? You know, well, it's very, it's varied and has actually changed um, over the last decade that I've been, uh, you know, preaching the whole plant-based diet um, thing. Um, but um, I, I think it, it varies, like it does with um, in in general society. In that, you know, for some people, it's just like, well, it's not even doesn't even feature on their radar. Other people have genuine interest, and then more and more, I'm meeting, um, you know, physicians and clinicians and cancer doctors that are themselves plant-based so I think there's a range of um, reactions but in my workplace in the last couple of years um, we've had really good conversations um, about plant-based diets and uh, mainly driven by sustainability and the fact that the healthcare system in the UK is trying to get to you know carbon neutral um, or carbon zero whatever the term is and that you know you can't do that without addressing the food environment so I was able to with a colleague of mine um, who's also vegan and plant-based um, run the No Meat May campaign um, last year and then we've just run um, a workplace veganuary challenge and you know as you as you say you meet more people who are interested and um, understand the relevance of it so um, yeah so mixed re mixed reactions for sure <laughs> well you're changing you're changing the world there there used to be I was born in 1963 and in the 50s and 60s doctors smoked probably into the 70s um, so now uh, I feel like doctors are going to start learning more about nutrition as uh, in the next few decades and it'll become more of a staple in their practice. Can you, like I asked you about, this is a basic question, but like I asked you, sometimes I feel like for myself, I miss some of the basics. It's always good for me to go back. So I think um, this will help people. Can you explain why diet has a positive effect on our health, especially vis-a-vis -vis cancer? Hmm. Yeah, um, because, you know, through our diet, we're exposing ourselves with um, various compounds and chemicals and um, nutrients that can either, you know, promote the process of cancer growth or um, retard it and stop it happening. Um, so, you know, for example, um, we know or have known at least since 2015, if not before, but when the WHO told us that processed red meat um, uh, was a group one carcinogen, it causes cancer, and red meat was a probable carcinogen, so it probably causes cancer, mainly in relation to colorectal cancer, but we also know it increases the risk of other cancers. If you just take that as an example, um, we know that when you consume these meats, your body forms these chemicals that then damage your DNA and sort of allow these rogue cells that shouldn't be there to sort of um, be present and get it, they're given a sort of abnormal sort of growth advantage or at least they're created so that they sit there and might grow into something in the future. Um, so particularly with processed meats, we're exposed to um, uh, nitrogen-like compounds, so nitrates and the nitrites there. Um, you've also got um, heme iron, which is the type of iron found in animal foods that damages DNA and causes this sort of oxidative stress. Um, and when you cook these meats at high temperatures, you also get the generation of heterocyclic amines and polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons. And they, again, you know, can, can actually damage the cells um, in the lining of the gut and, and elsewhere in the, in the body. But in contrast, you know, we know that um, the fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans, which we know are healthy, um, are full of nutrients that um, prevent that DNA damage, that counteract the stress that we're dealing with on a daily basis. Um, they're full of anti-inflammatory compounds. And of course, fiber, which has sort of magical properties really, um, in that it's good at getting rid of excess toxins and particularly cholesterol and estrogen from our body. Um, it regulates blood sugars, it keeps a healthy weight. Um, it sort of guards against all those processes that would otherwise be driving cancer. Um, and one of the really Really exciting areas of research that I'm um, following carefully really is that you know the health of our gut microbiome is also implicated in uh, firstly whether we get cancer or not and secondly how well we do with a diagnosis of, of cancer and of course you know our 
gut microbiome only thrive on a fiber rich polyphenol rich plant based diet everything else is is not necessary for for our gut microbiome so um, that 's another key reason you know if we're, if we 're keeping our gut microbes healthy that they are then making sure our immune system is in check and is able to function um, to keep the cancer cells that are being produced um, regularly at bay um, and and they also enhance the activity of the anti cancer type, type treatments that I would be prescribing alongside a healthy lifestyle so um, it, it's the field that's really taking off and um, really comes back to eating a healthy diet you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, for fat and exercise you, you mentioned inflammation and IGF one uh, IGF one yeah and tell tell me how those two and food interconnect yeah so I mean in, in, again in general you know either the foods you choose can um, be inflammatory um, and sort of injure the cells and the proteins and the DNA and and you can detect that by um, measuring markers of inflammation in the blood most um, usually it's it's a protein called C reactive protein but other inflammatory proteins so we know that there are certain foods that increase inflammation and the secretion of these inflammatory proteins that then sort of go on and damage cells and DNA um, and those foods are generally the ones that are derived from animal um, products because they lack all the anti-inflammatory compounds they lack fiber they're full of saturated fat and human iron all that we know in the laboratory cause inflammation and we can find that signal for inflammation in our in our body um, and the opposite is true for all the plant foods um, and healthy unsaturated fats you know from nuts and seeds and avocados and so forth um, that dampen down that inflammation and we can see the level come down so there have been studies head to head of you know plant-based diet versus you know a sort of usual standard American diet or, or Western diet and looking at the differences between the markers of inflammation and hands down you know sort of a veggie vegan or healthy plant-based diet will bring down your markers of inflammation and the same is true um, for IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor. So there's, there's two ways in which your body can increase IGF-1 through your diet. Um, you know, you well know that dairy is going to contain IGF-1 um, and therefore just consuming it will mean you have an ele elevated level or higher than you would normally have. And then we've had some elegant studies showing that the animal protein directly leads to an increase in IGF-1 levels. So consuming animal sources of protein, whether it be um, meat or um, red meat or poultry or um, eggs will increase um, IGF-1 levels. And again, if you look at the IGF-1 levels between omnivores and pescatarians and veggies and vegans, you know, those on a plant-based diet will be um, certainly have lower levels of IGF-1. And that's proposed to be one of the reasons why um, those eating a healthy plant-based diet have about a sort of 10 to 15% reduction in their risk of getting cancer. Why is the protein from animals more apt to elevate your IGF-1 when isn't protein protein? I thought it was the package it was in, but is protein in animals a different than a protein in uh, beans, for example? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a bit of both. So certainly it is the package. And as you say, the animal protein comes with saturated fat and cholesterol and heme iron, all of which sort of negatively affect our health. But also there are differences in the protein makeup as well. So for example, you have more acid forming sulfur containing um, amino acids in um, uh, animal proteins and you have more of the what we call the branch chain amino acids so valine isoleucine and, and so forth um, in animal proteins as well so the makeup and the combination i mean of course all proteins have all amino acids but it's just the quantities um, that are present seems to have quite a big effect on the kind of illnesses that we get and certainly having lower levels of the sulfur containing and and also methionine um, seems to be important in in sort of reducing the risks but like with all things it's really difficult to pinpoint just one thing it's the whole, whole package and you know rather than dissecting the individual components of, of, of the diet it's best to think about a varied colorful plant-based diet and then you know keeping away from those foods that we know increase the risk of cancer when a patient comes to you, 
uh, with a diagnosis of cancer and their diet is, uh, their lifestyle is very typical of a Brit or an American, meaning that they eat a lot of meat and uh, dairy and they don't exercise very much. Um, what, what do you tell them in terms of diet? Where do you start them? Do you think it's more important to get rid of the dairy or the meat or is it whatever the patient can, can do first? Yeah, I, th I think it really is meeting the patient where they are. You know, each patient is so different. Their, um, you know, circumstances are unique. Their level of understanding and their ability to cook and all those sort of things that are so different. And their ability to cope with all the news that's being given to them. You know, the first consultation of, you know, giving a diagnosis, the treatment. I mean, it's a life-changing, um, you know, conversation for them. So everyone's very different. And so you have to sort of have your way of gauging whether people are interested, receptive, have the ability to change, have that social and financial support that makes these sort of things um, easier. Um, so there is, there is a bit of a judgment call in that. But, um, you know, everyone asks, you know, what, what can I do? Because everyone wants, you know, to have a bit of control over their cancer journey. And, you know, most of it is just following direction from us as doctors and, you know, your nurse specialist and the chemotherapy nurses, you know, turn up today, make sure you do this, have this tablet and whatever. So, you know, people are wanting to be able to help themselves. So most people do ask um, about, you know, what can I do? And we talk about diet and, you know, like always, everyone thinks that they're eating a healthy diet already. So we sort of need to figure out kind of where they're at in terms of how many portions of fruits and vegetables how often they eat beans for example beans are not very common in the british diet at all other than high beans, big beans. <laughs> <laughs> exactly but other than that um, I, I think i read some shocking statistic that actually 16 percent of um, uh, vegetables that are consumed by children are from baked beans you know it's like a common kind of vegetable but um beyond that people aren't used to eating lots of beans and lentils opposed to kind of my upbringing as a south asian family indian family you know beans and lentils and pulses are, are your everyday staple so um you know just and 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 also you know we have a real problem like you guys do in the us that people are eating predominantly packaged and pre-prepared food so just sort of understanding you know whether people cook whether they're buying their foods um, from the supermarket whether they're actually you know buying fresh produce so I, I think um, you know what my initial suggestions really are based around those initial questions um, and their sort of level of understanding and their and, and their curiosity but yeah I mean I think I'm quite clear about two things um, that processed and red meat have no place in the diet um, and also alcohol really has no place in the diet if we're sort of including that in terms of food because I think the messaging around alcohol really is um, uh, not as it should be you know it is also a cancer causing agent and there is no safe limit and I think we have to be honest and then people make their their choices um, and then yeah I talk about making healthy swaps so um, top of that sort of healthy swaps would be swapping out dairy for something like um, soya which we know is so much more health promoting and, um, and and you know obviously the opposite for dairy which is implicated in in certain cancers and certainly doesn't do anything um, much for, for, for our health. That's great and I, I want to follow up on um, the alcohol because there's a lot of misunderstanding and obfuscation that for example red wine is healthy um, is, can you speak to that? So that <laughs> some of the folks, I don't drink at all, but if Dotsie was here, she'd be like, no, I want to keep my wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's interesting actually that the narrative has changed in the medical literature. And, you know, when people are writing about red wine and alcohol and the impact on um, health outcomes, really um, they're writing that um, the harms outweigh any perceived benefit because we know that benefit from the red wine is really just the polyphenols from the grapes so you know the resveratrol you don't need the actual alcohol clearly which is is a a toxin it gets metabolized into a cancer causing agent it mm -hmm. helps cancer causing agents to get into 
the cells. Um, so, but you know, in the context of a healthy diet pattern, if you had um, the occasional red wine, I suspect you wouldn't see um, a, a, a negative impact. But I think you know, there's so many other things that are better for your heart than red wine without any potential for harm. So fruits and vegetables and whole grains and what have you are really going to be the protective thing um, rather than some um, extracted polyphenols in, in your red wine. And I think when it comes to cancer, obviously, and cancer recurrence and thinking about living well after cancer, um, you know, that there, there is no longer any place um, for, for a toxin like alcohol, and in my view, for, for living well after cancer. It's the package. We have to keep remembering what the package is and not try and mm. pull apart this little good thing about it. I want to talk about your book. Okay, so I love your book. It's incredibly informative. It's, it's, um, the format is question and answer, which I love. Um, because I'm very, as Dotsie will tease me, I very just want the facts, ma'am. But you also write it in such, and you've written it with your sister, who is a doctor in Canada. And the it's so conversational, yet very detailed and based on scientific evidence. I just want to give you a huge shout out for this book, mm -hmm. Eating Plant-Based. I highly recommend it, not only for all of us who are already plant-based, because it answers questions that we didn't even think to ask that we might have, yeah, we didn't even know we didn't know. And it's, there's over, I think there's 110 questions or so in, in the book. Um, but it's also great for folks who, for your friends who want to go plant-based and are feeling like not sure because of all the disinformation and uh, competing information out there. Um, so anyway, fantastic. I want to give you a shout out for that. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, some more questions that come from the book um, and that you uh, have, have answered so eloquently there. Um, what are the top cancer fighting foods? Yeah, great question. And thanks for the compliments of the book. Um, my sister's also a cancer doctor in um, uh, Toronto in Ontario. So um, it's a shared passion and it brings together all the, the questions that we've been asked in the best part of the last decade. And hopefully we can go read the book. Don't ask me anymore. <laughs> um, but yes, in terms of cancer causing foods, now, like as, I, as I've said, you know, I don't think we should be picking out individual foods. We just eat a range of foods. But if you were going to ask me the top um, cancer preventing foods, I think top of the list has to be the cruciferous um, vegetables, um, you know, the, the um, vegetables such as cabbage and um, cauliflower and broccoli and kale. So um, because, you know, when you um, eat them, chew them, um, uh, cook them up, they um, generate this anti-cancer compound. Um, which is so sulforaphanes that then get further broken down in the body to compounds like indole-3 carbonyls. Um, and we've, we know from, you know, laboratory studies, looking at the cells and adding these compounds that they really can reduce the growth of cancer cells. They can change the expression of the genes in our cells. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're just it really do seem to be a superfood if there ever was one. And I don't believe in superfoods really. So I think, you know, having a portion of cruciferous vegetables um, on most days um, would be really beneficial. Um, mushrooms are really, really impressive. Um, there was a large study bringing together data from 17 different observational studies and people who ate um, mushrooms on most days. And it's not much of a, it's not a big portion thing, you know, a portion might be about 40 grams. So it's, it's tiny really, um, had about a 44% reduced risk of developing cancer. Um, and mushrooms have loads of compounds in it. We're not really sure um, like which one is the most um, health promoting, but there's one that's beta glucan it's a type of fiber um, that seems to be pretty good at um, keeping our immune system healthy and um, so that's another food um, then we've got soya I mustn't forget soya because that's a big myth isn't it that you know we should be staying away from soya but actually big big studies have come out just showing the enormous power of soya to 
reduce every single illness you can think of, but that includes many different um, cancer subtypes. Um, and for, for breast cancer, um, as you probably know, it also um, helps you live better after a diagnosis of breast cancer and reduces your risk of the breast cancer coming back. And that's because of those um, compounds, um, the isoflavones or the phytoestrogens that sort of dampen down um, the effect of estrogen in the body. Um, and the other food is not quite a vegetable, but the other food that's really useful um, that for, for cancer is flax seeds. Um, uh, you know, we, we think of it as being a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, which it is, um, but also they have these um, phytoestrogens called lignans in it as well that have also been shown to, to have anti-cancer properties. So um, that would be a few. What else did I write about then? Oh, berries, berries. You can't go wrong with berries, you know, anything with a dark um, uh, purple, ready um, uh, colour full of um, uh, anti-inflammatory compounds and phytonutrients and antioxidant compounds that really um, guard against the DNA damage that's occurring um, in our bodies all the time. So berries would be my top, sort of top fruit to try and incorporate. This is the kind of info folks you're going to get in the book, uh, which is clear and accessible. So I love it. I have two questions based on what you, your answer. One is in terms of cruciferous vegetables and to cook or not to cook, maybe all vegetables. Dr. Michael Greger says that we should cut the cruciferous vegetables to allow the sulforaphane to somehow have a chemical reaction. Another doctor we had on our show just poo-poo that incredibly. And so tell me what you think, Dr. Kassam. Yeah, no, well, I do buy into the, the cutting the cruciferous vegetable before you then cook it because it does activate the enzyme that you need, the myrosinase that you need to then um, make the sulforaphane. So that's fine. Um, sprouting is a way of really, really sort of increasing that sulforaphane um, levels sort of 100 times more than sort of a non sprouted. So if you're into sprouting, I haven't quite got into regular sprouting, but um, if you do, then that's a good, good thing to sort of um, maximize. Um, in your salads and things um, but I think you just need a variety so I mean I, I don't get hung up about you know um, raw versus cooked I think you just need to sort of you know to have a variety of salads and soups and what have you and and sort of overall you'll probably do the right thing but there you know there are certain foods um, like um, tomatoes, for example, the lycopene in that, it becomes more potent as you cook it. So, you know, cooking tomatoes or, you know, the already cooked tin tomatoes probably have better sort of anti-cancer properties than, than just the fresh one. But I, I, I don't think we have to overcomplicate things. And I certainly go for a mixture. But yes, yeah, so having a little bit of sort of raw cruciferous can really sort of bring out that um, uh, the, the potency of the sulforaphane and then obviously the way we cook you know obviously not boiling away all the nutrients and sort of lightly cooking steaming and you know just till, till you get that sort of um, bold green color of the broccoli until it's just sort of cooked and not overdone will help preserve some of those um, nutrients. Oh, and do you need to wait uh Dr. Greger says to wait a few minutes before cooking a cruciferous vegetables after yeah. you cut it. So I can't remember, 10 minutes or something? Yeah, I think it's 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so just pre-chop them. And it's, it's easy because, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of us just do the prep on a Sunday night or something before the week. So yeah, do all your chopping, you know, have it in the fridge. Or, um, and uh, yeah, or I guess if you, you know, frozen veg is probably fine too, isn't it? It's already pre-cooked for, uh, pre chopped for you and um, some of that activation ha has happened. So yeah, about 15, 20 minutes. It's the same with um, garlic actually in the allium family. So the alanase enzyme, um, that's another whole group of anti-cancer um, compounds and, and foods, um, garlic and leeks and onion, that family have organosulfur compounds that um, can do with a bit of chopping first and, and then um, cooking. Great. And I wanted to ask if you know why soy has gotten such a bad rap. I remember it as being, um, because I, I feel I'm still affected by what I learned 20 years ago about soy and that it was um, the hormones, I guess, the estrogen in it, which is hilarious because those folks who drink milk, cow's milk, they're getting a lot of pregnant cow estrogen. But <laughs> so is that why we have, a, it's a, gotten a bad rap? Yeah, I mean, I think a few decades ago, a lot of the studies that were done within soya were in animal models, which we know 
very rarely impact how um, foods and drugs um, uh, act in the humans. So, you know, you take what, what you want from that. Although the doses that they used were not doses that would ever be consumed, they were just far too high. Um, so that was the main reason because animal studies um, you know, led to this sort of misinformation um, and that's sort of it's difficult once there's a few papers out there they're always you can always find them and, and you know if you don't delve in deep deeper to the and, and um, the current knowledge then you might get waylaid by this sort of older data um, but I do think that there's some and there's a dairy lobby isn't there i mean you know the dairy industry have do a great job at trying to remove anything that might be um competition um because you know as you say we don't talk about the hormones in dairy it's very rare for anyone to bring that up you only talk about the protein and the calcium and uh, you know uh, those sort of things so um I, I do think that they have done a good job at um keeping these um myths uh, and old data going um, and you know they keep doing that with the environmental aspects of growing soya of which of course most of the soya grown goes to feed animals rather than you know the less than 10 percent that's eaten by humans so i think it's a combination of both you know old animal data difficult to get rid of you know people's perception of that data and the dairy lobby that will do anything and everything to persuade you that an alternative is is less good for you and for men, it's still good, right? Soy is still oh, very healthy for men. Absolutely. All of us, you know, all stages of life, as soon as you're weaned from your mother's milk, you should be incorporating soya. And, you know, if, if we worry about quality of protein, which I think we shouldn't, but it's a great um, high quality protein, you know, when elders are trying to eat a bit more of the protein that they need. Um, so all through life stages, um, yeah, men and women. Now let's talk about sugar. Um, I personally struggle not to eat sugar or not to eat too much of it. And, I, and the reason I don't wanna eat it is because I've heard that it is a cancer causer and can also harden my arteries. Um, so could you talk to me about sugar and cancer? Yeah, I think it's a complicated topic, actually. And I wasn't, wouldn't go as far as saying it causes cancer. And also, it does come down to, again, the whole package as to, you know, what your, what your sugar is contained in. You know, you have an oat biscuit or an oat and banana biscuit with a bit of sugar in. I, I don't think that's going to be the be all and end all. But ultimately, having an excess amount of sugar, particularly if you're exceeding um, your calorie requirements as well, again, will lead to inflammation, which then leads to other chronic illnesses. So it does cause inflammation. It also then is associated with excess weight, body weight as well. Um, so um, if you're consuming up above and beyond the, the calories. Um, and, you know, the, the um, fructose, it's mainly fructose um, that it's sort of metabolized, metabolized down to, it is also known to, um, you know, um, well, it'll increase the production of fatty acids like triglycerides, it gets 10 excess fructose will go to triglycerides, which will be laid down in your body organs. And again, inflammation and it all can also be um, uh, it, it turned into uric acid as well which can then inhibit the action of um, compounds that you need to keep your blood vessels healthy so it can in, it affect your cardiovascular health in a negative way as well so there's lots of intricate mechanisms um, and you know I think we should be limiting added uh, free sugars um, but you know, I don't think eating now and again is going to be the be all and end all and whether it directly causes cancer. I, I'm not sure. I've only seen one study that shows that, you know, the, the uh, a relationship between the amount of free sugar consumed and the risk of cancer. I haven't seen that data repeated. So um, let's see. Thank you. you. You made me feel a little better. <laughs> Let's talk about fat in the diet because everyone, a lot of um, people talk about the Mediterranean diet as a very healthy diet, but I see it as a diet. It has, uh, it contains fish, uh, fish oils and olive oil. Where do you come down in terms of fat in the diet and cancer? Yeah, um, well, there isn't a particularly strong association between 
um, the consumption of particular fats and the onset of cancer. I think it comes down more to the association of what those fats are contained in. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about red meat, that saturated fat, along with the animal protein, along with the heme iron, is going to be increasing your risk of, of, of cancer. But if you extracted just the saturated fat, would it cause cancer? I think that's unlikely. Um, however, there's a little bit of data supporting, you know, higher diets in saturated fat after a diagnosis of cancer, particularly breast cancer, leading to uh, a shorter survival. So there's something that in terms of survivorship that may be key there. Um, and, you know, it's always about, you know, if you're eating one thing, you're eating less of another. So again, it sort of depends um, which is having the bigger effect. We all need fat in the diet. I don't have a particular go-to amount of fat, protein and carbohydrates that you have to have in your diet. I think different combinations suit different people. Um, it's really about the source of the fat. So from intact healthy plant foods like um, uh, nuts and seeds and avocado and olives. Um, I'm personally not a great fan of, of uh, the refined oils, even if they are the sort of extra virgin olive oil, because um, it makes life a bit difficult to maintain a healthy weight with the calorie density. But I think a healthy plant-based diet can be healthy with or without a good quality oil that kind of comes down to personal choice. Do you need fish? Absolutely not. It's not doing anything there. It's certainly better than red and processed meat, but it's certainly not better than consuming um, plant sources of protein like beans and nuts. And, and, and that's been shown uh, as well. And I think even though we can't see a signal for um, health problems related to the contaminate contaminants in fish, I think they will become much, much more apparent. You know, the mercury, the dioxins, the PCBs, all those um, toxins that um, accumulate in fish. We, we don't need them. They're not doing anything there. We can get much healthier sources of fats and protein. Um, so, yeah, um, I think the Mediterranean diet look, always looks good because it's better than what we, we're all eating right now. But, um, you know, there has finally been the head to head with the low fat vegan diet and the Mediterranean diet study from um, the physicians committee. And, you know, the, the vegan, low fat vegan diet came out pretty good um, on, on virtually all parameters except for um, blood pressure which the Mediterranean diet did a little bit better in, in that study. And why do you think? Was there more salt in the vegan diet or? Uh, no, I mean, I think, again, we don't know for sure, but, um, you know, the proposed mechanisms might be because the, um, the vitamin E and the other antioxidants in the olive oil, it could be. And, you know, um, in, in um, sort of low fat dairy does have some con compounds that can um, be better than other foods for your blood pressure, you know, if you're swapping out the, the, the red meat and what have you for the dairy, that might be better. It's difficult, it's difficult to, to know. I mean, I personally would like to see the Physicians Committee do a study with allowing some nuts and seeds and flax seeds particularly because they, they will positively impact your heart health and, and blood pressure, but their low fat approach sort of limits um, the nut consumption. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there's absolutely no doubt that low fat, a bit higher fat, plant-based diet, um, it depends what your health goals are really, um, it is a really good choice to make overall. We've talked about eating. What about not eating? How does that affect um, cancer? I've heard of fasting regimens that are supposed to give your body a rest to clean out, do its job instead of digesting, uh, would be working on the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think in, in theory, it makes a lot of sense. And I know that, you know, obviously certain physicians in the US have had great results with their patients on, on individual levels. We just don't have enough robust um, data for me to recommend that to my patients right now. Um, I think it's kind of a watch the space. Um, there's been a couple of studies that have reported that have been done in a robust way um, that have given us a signal that there could be some positive impacts, but it's not been sort of earth shattering that I have to, you know, tell everyone that they must start fasting. So, um, you know, I think, you know, eating with your circadian rhythm, you know, having more um, earlier in the day, having less later in the day, maybe a 12 hour window. I think those are the sort of things that we know for sure are good for us. Um, and beyond that, I think I would want a bit more data before blanket telling everyone with cancer that they need to do some intermittent fasting. 
Let's move over to your telemedicine business. Um, so out of the pandemic did come some good things. And one of them was this explosion of working with others over the internet instead of having to be in person. So tell us about Plant Health Online, which is your telemedicine practice. Yeah. Um, so that really came out of, so what I first started doing in the UK, as you mentioned, was Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which is a little like, well, we want it to be like the Physicians Committee, but we're decades behind, but we provide education and advocacy on healthy plant-based diets. So, um, you know, fact sheets and articles and what have you. And then it soon became apparent that people actually wanted to see doctors who are plant-based and who understand diet and lifestyle. Um, and, you know, we didn't have, um, a, a, you know, a lot of people practicing in that way that combined both the sort of allopathic conventional medicine alongside the lifestyle um, medicine, because I think the two go hand in hand, you know, we, we, the benefits of, of both approaches together. Um, and so, yes, as you say, you know, as it became clear that um, the patients were enjoying seeing their physicians via video call, it was convenient, it was safe, it was effective, we could do lots of things like that. Um, myself and my colleague, Dr. Laura Freeman, who's a GP and a lifestyle medicine physician and also a cancer survivor, were like, well, why don't, why don't we give this a go and um, bring a plant-based lifestyle medicine service um, to the UK public? And we partly sort of, um, well, we realised that at the at the same time, um, the plant-based telehealth in um, the US had sort of come off, um, uh, got off the ground and we spoke with Laurie Marbas and um, Anthony, her business partner, and we were like, well, you know, maybe it, it, maybe it is a thing and we can try it out here in the UK. Um, so, yeah, so we have, um, I don't, I don't um, practice on it as then I'm not seeing patients, I'm sort of behind the scenes uh, making it tick along, but we have Laura Freeman who's GP and lifestyle medicine physician, we've got Lisa Simon who's a dietitian, we've got Sue Keneally who's um, a bariatric physician and also GP and nutritionist um, and um, all of them are lifestyle medicine professionals as well. So. Um, we combine, um, you know, regular medicine um, with um, plant-based, uh, food-based and lifestyle medicine to really give people um, additional options to improving their health, um, reducing their reliance on uh, medication um, and a generally thriving um, and range of conditions from your everyday high blood pressure, high cholesterol to fertility issues to bowel and GI issues, um, managing weight, um, and also, you know, thriving for, for athletes. Um, as you guys know, I mean, you know, you can use a, a plant-based diet for, for just um, optimizing your performance uh, as well. So range of conditions um, and um, lifestyles um, that can benefit from plant-based and lifestyle medicine. In the United States, doctors who practice telehealth have to be uh, registered, certified, uh, somehow um, pass an exam in each state. So I can only see a doctor who's uh, certified in California, for example, because that's where I am, which is really disappointing because I could actually drive to another state and see that person and it wouldn't be against the law. But I, you know, I respect that this is a new, a new thing and hopefully they'll be more open so that doctors fantastic doctors in California can help people in Illinois, for example. Are you able to practice all throughout the United Kingdom? So Wales, Ireland, et cetera? Yes, okay. yeah, absolutely. Not just so Great we, Britain? Yeah, so we, we can practice throughout the UK. Our, our problems come with practicing outside of the, the, the UK because I guess you know we're regulated by the General Medical Council and our practice is regulated by the Care Quality Commission, which is a, a, a regulatory body based in in England um, and then it comes down to your own professional indemnity as to whether you can practice outside of um, the, the UK but we've got plenty of work that needs to be done in that's the UK, right so that, that's, that's all good <laughs> um, if, you, yeah. if you were still part of the uh, European Union would you be able to practice with all the other countries no no, no I still? don't I don't think so our dietitian Lisa and our nutritionist um, stroke GP Sue can um, offer their dietetic and nutrition services outside of the um, UK and um, because their indemnity is slightly different from doctor indemnity um, uh, but um, yeah as I say we're just trying to get the UK public a bit healthier. <laughs> Speaking of getting healthier you have a 21 day health challenge. Tell us we about do. that and can folks in the United States and Australia and Germany etc join? 
Yeah, for sure. So okay. as part of our education and advocacy, we do have a 21 day plant based health challenge, which is run by Dr. Leila Dagan, who's the education lead at Plant Based Health Professionals UK. Um, it's, it's like the usual challenge is you sign up uh, for free and you get daily emails with um, written information, with videos, with meal plans, recipe ideas, um, a massive downloadable PDF of um, uh, recipes from all around the world. Um, and Leila has been doing doing um, a fortnightly Zoom Q&A um, uh, sort of live session. So that's quite unique, really. We're really grateful to be supported by Veg Fund. Um, so you can tune in and um, ask your questions live to a qualified nutritionist, personal trainer, ex-MD, so highly qualified individuals. So yeah, absolutely, can uh, anyone can tune in and sign up. So where can they find that? Can they find that on Plant Health Online or at Plant Based Health Professionals UK? Um, both, but to oh. stick with uh, stick with plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com or um, pbhp.uk. But I'm sure you'll have it in your show notes. But plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com, and there's the 21 day um, plant based health challenge. Excellent, excellent. And how can listeners contact you? if they want to find you or follow you on social media? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just through the website. So plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com or um, if, you're, if um, you've got some UK listeners who want to um, access healthcare, then that's plantbasedhealthonline.com or plantbasedhealthonline.co.uk. Um, and yeah, and then I'm on all the usual social media channels. So um, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter um, under my name, but also plant-based health professionals. So, um, but contacting through the um, website is perfect. And don't forget everybody to look up eating plant-based and either buy it for yourself or your friends who are, have, are thinking about turning vegan. So thank you so much, Dr. Kassam, for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.